day, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Governance and Policy Podcast by the Adam Smith Center, Singapore's first and only organization promoting pro-market values. The aim of this podcast is educational, to demonstrate the importance of economics, public policy ideas, and the humanities in general. I'm Joshua, and I'll be the host for today's episode. Today, we are joined by Dr. Roger A. Pelkey Jr., who will speak on the misuse and abuse of climate models in modern-day environmentalism. Dr. Pelkey was a scientist at the National Center for Atmospheric Research and the Director of Sports Governance Center at the University of Colorado, where he continues to teach. He has written much literature on the fields of environmentalism and sports science. Thank you for joining us today, Doctor. To start us off, could you explain what are climate models and how do they factor into modern day climate change science and policies? Yeah, it's really uh, important to understand that the, the under the umbrella of climate models are an incredible diversity of models, some that uh, model the earth system, some that model economics, um, some that model policy choices, um, some that try to wrap all that up together. Um, and it's important to, to understand that um, we only know that climate change um, is a significant problem because of advances that were made in um, physical modeling of the climate system in the 1960s, 1970s, um, and through to today. So they have been extremely important in helping us to recognize a problem that might be much more difficult or impossible to, to see or detect um, without the use of those models. You've mentioned like this disparity in models or how they're different models. Would you, would you care to like um, elaborate on what roughly, are there any um, divisions within or like how are these models different from each other? How do they differ from one another? Yeah, so um, probably what most people are familiar with when they, they think of a computer model is um, what they see on a, on a television weather forecast. Um, and what you see is the, the evolution of the atmosphere today, tomorrow, the next day. Um, and you know, not many people see the code, computer code that underlies those models, but they see the outcome um, right. and have a sense of what, what the models do. Weather models are uh, a good illustration of um, a broader class of what are called Earth system models that, that seek to, to model the, the physical Earth system. Um, and these models um, are not, um, they don't, forecast who's going to win elections. They don't predict the economy. Um, if you want to say something about uh, future climate change, um, then we have to start um, inputting factors such as how, how much carbon dioxide will be emitted in the future. What's the global population going to be? Um, what's the size of the economy? Um, once you start asking those questions, you have to go a little further and say, well, what kind of energy systems will we have? How much coal, how much nuclear, how much natural gas, how much solar, how much wind. Um, and then your, your projections in the future become contingent or dependent upon um, some of these assumptions. So in climate modeling, um, it has become uh, scenario based. Yep. So it's uh, a projection of the future dependent on the realization of a particular scenario going forward. Um, and, and that has evolved over the last 30 years or so um, to be much more sophisticated, uh, much more granular in the sense of having much more detail. Um, and there are an enormous number of models um, that seek to put these different factors together to project the, the climate future. There is a, a distinction between scenarios that tell us um, a conceivable or plausible future versus scenarios that try to project or predict what the, the most likely future will be. All right. um, and there's been a debate uh, in the literature and among experts um, for decades over ha using scenarios to inform us about plausible futures or using scenarios to predict the future. Um, and that is a debate that continues in the literature. So some of these models would tend to be more alarmist in nature, right? That seems to be uh, an ongoing narrative across some of this um, environmentalistic literature that's being published recently, or at least in the past decade or so. Yeah, so when you take your scenarios, one thing that, um, that has been done historically um, has been to try to, 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 to bound what the future might be. So you take a very extreme case um, on one end, an extreme case on the other end, and say, well, the reality is going to be somewhere in between. Um, 
in the climate science, um, we've gotten to a point where a particular scenario, um, and without getting too technical, uh, it's called RCP 8.5, um, has been uh, used as, as a centerpiece of a lot of research. Um, and it turns out that it's a very extreme scenario. It projects a massive increase in coal use uh, worldwide. Um, and a corresponding increase in carbon dioxide emissions. And uh, a scientist at the University of British Columbia named Justin Ritchie uh, wrote his PhD thesis looking at this uh, particular scenario um, and found that it was based on assumptions that go back to the 1990s, uh, very simplistic assumptions that uh, the, the more coal we use, uh, the more that we will use because we learn how to extract it and so on. And it turns out the real world isn't going in that direction. Um, Coal use is uh, going down in many places, particularly in, in Europe, um, in North America. Um, and it doesn't look like at all, like it's plausible to think that the world will be um, focusing its energy entirely on coal, uh, getting rid of solar, getting rid of nuclear, um, and so on. Even though there are places like Japan, uh, China, uh, Germany that are, are building new coal plants, India also, um, the, the the scenario itself um, seems increasingly implausible. Now, the problem is that particular scenario um, was placed um, by the scientific community at the center of a lot of climate research. Yeah. Um, and it produces very extreme scenarios. And there are reasons why you would want to do that. Um, it's, it's, it's not a, a yes or no question on whether you use an extreme scenario. It's using it in a way that's fit for purpose a proper use. Um, and if you want to explore what might the world look like in a very high emission scenario, that's great. Uh, but that's entirely different than saying this is the path we're on and to base um, important policy questions like cost benefit analyses, um, policy uh, evaluations on that particular scenario. So like you mentioned that this um, this very like maybe not like an, maybe like an extreme this extreme model is being placed as a centerpiece of um the un policy making and a lot of national institutions that might be following how do you think this has impacted the environmentalistic policy that they've chosen to take or the measures they've chosen to implement yeah i mean this is this is one where um there's a lot of, i mean we have a, a massive long paper <laughs> on this topic and the story is long and convoluted um but it's a little bit like the, the children's game of telephone yep. where you start out and you whisper in someone's ear who's next to you and they whisper the sentence to someone else. And by the time it gets around the circle of kids, it's a whole different sentence. Um, yep. the, the placing the extreme scenario at the centerpiece of um, what earth system modeling and integrated assessment modeling um, has had a number of, of consequences. Um, one is, um, and, and let me say, the scientific community may have perfectly legitimate and reasonable reasons for using an extreme scenario. Um, and one is they want to identify um, a greenhouse gas signal in model results. And it helps if you have a much stronger uh, set, set of emissions going in. That's fine. Um, but the confusion arises when people think that's where the world is headed. And so we get... Uh, a series, I mean, every day there are uh, many papers published using this extreme scenario, um, and a good proportion of them call it business as usual, as if that's where we're going. The result is that um, these papers are published, universities like attention, so they issue press releases, um, and the, the more extreme or the scarier sounding the result, the more likely it'll be written about in the newspapers. Um, and the way that many people encounter the issue of climate change is through these extreme scenarios. Um, and then we have a picture that's painted of the climate future that's uh, apocalyptic. Um, and it's, it's out of step with what people might hear from um, assessment groups like the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC. And it becomes yeah. very difficult to, to reconcile. So, um, it has another effect when it's used as the basis for cost benefit exercises. So if that's the, the path we're on, and then moving from that path, um, there'd be two consequences. One is that it would be really, really expensive because it's such a high carbon future. Um, 
and also it warps how we think about costs and benefits. Um, and it turns out that um, certainly in the near term, if you take a look at uh, near term energy um, outlooks from groups like the um, International Energy Agency, um, major energy companies, uh, we're not anywhere near those, those uh, significant uh, scenarios uh, that project massive increases in carbon dioxide. Now that said, addressing carbon dioxide emissions and climate change is still a huge, enormous challenge. Um, it's just not as large a challenge as you would think looking at these models. Um, so it, it really, um, I think, has shaped how people, even experts, um, come to think about the climate issue and what it means to actually respond to it. All right. So that's, that's good news, actually. It means that our situation is not as dire as some would have us believe. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 there's two sides to it. One is um, it's good news in the sense that we're not headed for this apocalyptic future. Um, it's, it's bad news in the sense that the challenge of going from where we're at to say net zero CO2 is still enormous and huge. Uh, and I guess the other bad news is that a lot of our policy discussions are based on using a scenario that is not reflective of what's happening on planet Earth. So it's very hard to have a, um, have a coherent, sensible discussion of policy options if they are grounded in a scenario that doesn't reflect the real world. Definitely, definitely. So what policy solutions or like measures would you personally recommend or advocate for that the global and national institutions take moving forward um, to target this you know, climate change or carbon emissions problem that we're dealing with? Yeah, I, I mean, it's really important to um, be precise when we talk about the problem of climate change. Um, climate change is many problems. Um, it includes things like adaptation to weather extremes and, and variability. It includes things like energy access and, uh, and justice issues um, between the North and South. Um, but if we're talking about just carbon dioxide emissions, um, we have a pretty sense, we globally have a pretty good sense of what it takes to reduce those emissions. Yep. Um, and it's huge. It's, uh, uh, we need to replace fossil fuel burning coal, natural gas, and petroleum with alternatives. And those could be hydroelectric, could be nuclear, could be solar, wind, um, geothermal, take your pick. Um, and there's two ways to do that. One is um, through technologies of energy consumption, so how we use energy, and the, and the other, and the big lever, are technologies of energy production, um, where we get that energy from. And if we want to stabilize carbon dioxide um, levels in the atmosphere at a low level, so something consistent with 1.5 degrees or 2 degrees Celsius, um, in, in just a, a round number, the world needs to um, deploy about one nuclear power plant of clean energy um, every day uh, to 2050. And uh, that's about 10,000 plants. Maybe it's 5,000, maybe it's 15,000. It's a lot. Um, and if people don't like nuclear energy, then we can talk about it in terms of wind turbines or, um, or, or solar farms or, or whatever. Um, and at the same time, we have to re retire an equivalent amount of fossil fuel generation. Um, it's, a, it's a challenge really of the better part of a century um, and it's massive. And, and we know how energy transitions occur. Um, if clean energy is cheaper, safer, cleaner, say air pollution, um, we've shown um, overall um, a desire to move from dirtier, less efficient to cleaner, more efficient energy. Um, we see this um, in many places around the world with natural gas uh, replacing coal yeah. uh, because natural gas is, is, is cleaner, um, it's cost competitive. We also see in many places solar and wind becoming increasingly cost competitive. And the key to all of these is technology. And Technology that um, is more advanced leads to lower costs. Um, the marketplace um, tends to prefer them. Now, government policies make a big difference. Um, yeah. Standards, regulations um, have all been essential in helping to promote the, the deployment of cleaner energy. 
So um, if we look around the world, there are places um, that are very successful, maybe because of their unique characters. So Sweden, for example, has a lot of hydroelectricity. Um, France is heavily dependent on nuclear, um, not for environmental reasons, but for geopolitical reasons um, dating back to the 1970s. Um, the United States is, is seeing coal decline, um, being replaced by um, renewables and natural gas. Uh, the United Kingdom is uh, just about uh, on the brink of retiring all of its coal plants, um, partly because of demand destruction, which is not a good thing and probably won't happen around the world. Um, and then we see uh, places like, like China, um, which has a massive economy, um, facing decisions about it to what degree they want to rely on coal plants going forward. Um, Japan, similar. Um, Japan, after Fukushima, uh, soured on nuclear, which was a large share of their electricity production, um, but lacking um, domestic energy resources, people, the lights are going to have to come on somehow. So really the way to, to accelerate decarbonization is um, through the deployment of technologies that emit less carbon. Now there's a wild card we could talk about and that's car carbon capture or air capture of carbon dioxide, um, mm -hmm. which um, it, it's costly at present, um, but if it were a policy priority, we could develop um, many more technologies than we have in that area to learn how to capture carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, turn it into products or sequester it. Um, and in fact, that is one technology that's built into many of the scenarios um, of policy success going forward. Um, so there are options. Um, and what we would have to do um, in individual nations and collectively is decide that we want to actually devote the sort of resources to energy technologies that we de devote to issues like health or military, um, where we spend a lot of money. Um, and so far, uh, we have not taken a um, technology first approach to um, carbon emissions. All right, thank you. So in short, you would say that moving on from now, perhaps trade, I'm not trade, like innovation and technology would play a key part in the way that we deal with climate change rather than maybe blanket um, government policies. Technology is the way that our world actually like, shifts forward and deals with this problem. Yeah, I think we have to, I mean, it's really important to understand that, that, that technological innovation is, and deployment is um, the result of, of collaborations between governments and the private sector. Um, and they're, they're so tightly intertwined that it's hard to tease them apart. Um, what we do know is that the private sector on its own um, is not going to come up with um, public interest technologies in the energy space at a rate fast enough to quickly lower emissions. Um, so there will have to be mandates. And um, you know, the, 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 an important policy that is really necessary um, is also a price on carbon. Mm. Right, so um, there needs to be some way, I mean, imagine this, let's say um, that the, the, the world is enormously successful in deploying clean energy, which means that demand for fossil fuels, um, coal, natural gas, oil starts to, to plummet. When that price goes down, they become again more competitive with the renewables. So there needs to be some floor price on um, fossil fuels. And to the degree that we depend less on fossil fuels, the higher that price can go. Um, I've written about, and some of my colleagues have written about the idea of um, associating a carbon tax and the revenue that's raised with investments in energy technologies. Um, that way people see an immediate and clear payoff. Um, a further dimension is the fact that there are still uh, billions of people around the world who lack complete access to modern energy services. Um, and so uh, the world is going to need to deploy a substantial, huge amount of, of new energy um, technologies in the coming decades. Uh, and that's going to have to come from somewhere. And so there, there are reasons beyond just carbon to um, improve our ability to innovate in the energy space. All right. Thank you so much for just like the past 20 minutes. I'm sure you've, our viewers will be very appreciative.